Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mongo. I am the moderator for this. And we're going to go ahead and introduce our panelists and get right into the topic. I write. I'm also a former prior service corporal. I enjoyed it. I had way too much fun at it. And I've made study of military history and logistics a hobby. Um, Shannon, would you mind? Hello, uh, my name is Shannon Babb. I'm a professional writer with Central Utah Water Conservancy District. So I produce educational materials as my full-time job. I'm also a trained soil scientist and hydrologist. So I'm here to help represent the farmers. Brandon? Hi, uh, my name is Brandon Jones. I am an author. I really like writing uh, fantasy with a lot of intrigue and uh, and hard uh, hard magic elements. Uh, my novel, The Broken Man, um, in addition to featuring those fun things, also uh, has agromancy in it. Uh, so uh, magical <clears throat> farming techniques, basically. I'm excited for the panel. Gordon. My name is Gordon Fry. I teach, I'm a adjunct professor of history for Vincennes University and our campus is on Naval Base Kitsap in Bremerton, Washington. I teach American history, world history, and naval history to sailors for the most part. Um, haven't gotten many Marines, but a few soldiers. It's really weird. Anyway, I also uh, do a whole lot of other different things, but that's my primary focus. I do uh, the writing I do is primarily nonfiction. Mr. Modison, sir. Am I coming through here? I've had some problems with the mic. You're fine, you're, sir. You're good. Okay. Um, I'm Lee Modison. I've written quite a few books along the way. I'm a former Naval pi Navy pilot, uh, and I spent about 20 years in Washington, D.C. And you That's survived. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true too. And Gordon, the reason you probably don't have so many Marines is because they have to be literate first. I know, you know, they have to have high school educations and all that. <laughs> but I have a lot of Marines in my other, as customers in my other job, which is I'm that unicorn that's a history professor that works in a gun store too. So I'm a unicorn, and the Marines come for that. Not the unicorn, the guns. Very cool. They'd probably come for both. Yeah, they want to hunt unicorns, probably. <laughs> Murder yeah. them and eat them. Yeah. That or have one in the barracks sitting around on a field day weekend. That would be fun. To say the least. Yeah. So tonight's topic, plowshares and soldiers. How does a state keep an army fed? What has to happen in order to make that possible? Well, the guys with the swords do not change, uh, turn them into plowshares because uh, that way they have to plow for the guy who didn't. That's number one rule. Well, number two rule is actually, I'm going to go back to my economics background. For any, any society to have a standing army, you've got to have what is called an agricultural surplus, i.e. whoever's doing the food producing the food has to produce more than enough beyond what it takes to sustain them and it's got to be collected by an organization usually by a central authority uh, you can't have a standing army without that absolutely agree with you on that and it's hilariously something that you see throughout history unless i miss my mark on it the romans were really the first to I wouldn't say industrialize it, but they started getting it really organized. Well, they're actually pretty good at that. That was sort of a pillage section of, the, of it, though. Basically, they used their force to get grain from Egypt, and at that time, you could also get it from northern Africa. And as a matter of fact, you can date the fall of the Roman Empire, the final fall, when they stopped paying for the grain coming from... Um, Egypt and Africa, and all of a sudden you couldn't have breads and circuses in Rome. And that's you can really date the fall, what, the fall of the Western Roman Empire from that point. It is hard to have bread without wheat. I could actually make a comment 
on that because it turns out the Egyptians were the first one to create a scientific tool to measure the to measure water it's called the Nileometer. And depending on what the depth of the flooding of the Nile was, it helped predict whether or not they were going to go to war because they were so in tune with their river that they knew that floods of certain size would give them bumper crops. And when they had bumper crops coming, that's when they chose to go to war. Well, also most campaigns in the ancient times, actually up until very recently, were done um, between planting time and harvest time uh, so that you did have a surplus of uh, males who could go out and fight like with the Greeks um, who were primarily militia more you know they weren't professional soldiers in that regard they were more of a militia um, citizen soldiers and they um, you know after the planting you could go to war and you had to be done with that campaign before it was time to harvest and that's a, a cycle a, a rhythm that lasted well into the 19th century. So basically, what what enabled modern warfare was the French invention of canning. Yep, absolutely. Prior to that, prior to that, you were limited by how much food you could carry by spoilage, or by literally operating off of pillage. Mm -hmm. And in essence. The, Fr the French way of French adoption of canning allowed them to store and, if you will, stack food in the wagons rather than taking it out on the civilians. Mm -hmm. Well, and armies always brought along herds of animals, you know, literally meat on the hoof as their traveling commissary. <clears throat> so you yeah. had to have huge just acting as herdsmen to go yep. along with the so if the, you look at the uh, Mongols in history, that was part of what gave them the range that they did. Not only were their people soldiers, but they had they grown up and been raised caring for these herds, managing them. That was part of how they earned their right to be called a man. So it was easier for them to advance because, hey, their version of 7-Eleven is right there. <laughs> yeah, if they can't eat the cows, you eat the horses. Interestingly, um, around the time of Justinian uh, and the explosion came to be uh, Krakatoa uh, <clears throat> and you have a it effectively a nuclear winter, a volcanic winter, uh, it killed off a lot of the herds of the Turkic, uh, of the Turkic herdsmen in Central Asia and that allowed the Mongol horsemen to move westward because horses um, were a little more able to eat the grains than the cattle were because the Turks were primarily based on cattle and the Mongols on horses. Um, there's all kinds of really weird things that go uh, along uh, with climate changes as you know, certainly is on the topics um, in the news today. So, um, you know, when you change climates, just like with the Romans, when climate changed and the, um, the granaries of North Africa were less productive and towards the end of the Roman Empire, you see a collapse of the Roman Empire and collapse of civilization in general. Brandon, well, did you have anything you wanted to add before we? Yeah, I basically coming at it from more of a, a story than a history perspective. Uh, the, the core of it is whoever can afford to feed the armies um, is basically they have the upper hand, they have the power. Uh, and so keeping that in mind as you're building your your world building, building your stories, power isn't just, you know, who swings the sword the hardest. It's there's a lot of logistics that you can get into the weeds too. But amateur uh, study tactics, professional study logistics. You guys beat me to that one. Sorry. But basically <laughs> I was gonna say there are two sides, two sides to the supply. One side is, where do you get the food? And the second side is, how do you get it to the soldiers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are two yep. separate frames, so to speak. <clears throat> and it's not just enough to get it there. It's got to be something they'll eat. When I was in Afghanistan, our platoon sergeant, so the man in charge for roughly 70-something Marines and sailors, put in an order through supply 
for tray rations. Come three to a box, you pull the little tab and you've got food that gets heated by a little internal chemical heater. Fantastic device. The problem that the staff sergeant had is that he accidentally hit the wrong buttons and ordered the same exact meals for breakfast and dinner for six months. Ouch. At that point, <laughs> morale starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. And the troops will do things like live out of their boxes from home. Did that. <clears throat> I lost weight there, no problem. Pass the Tabasco. We <laughs> ran out of Tabasco. We started stealing it oh, from no. the chow hall. If our <laughs> guys imagine. are taking a supply run somewhere for fuel, oh, excuse us, we're going through the chow hall and stealing everything. Barbecue sauce could be traded for uh, cans of chewing tobacco. <laughs> and that bad. is a lesson that authors need to remember. Troops will in a pinch steal whatever they can. <laughs> yeah, well, it's amazing how much um, the use of fossil fuels, starting with the steam age, changed, well, and, and canning, changed uh, the face of warfare. You, you are able to have industrial levels of warfare when you have industrial levels of um, of transportation and food production. And before that, you had small armies. Uh, 40,000 was usually about what could be counted on to be fed locally. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, again, logistics, that's making the food and getting it to your troops is absolutely important. Napoleon said an army travels on its stomach. And it absolutely it does. does. Yeah. And so, at, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Chad. And certain places at the on the globe have advantages over others. You sit at the uh, equatorial mm -hmm. regions, and you have such a high rate of spoilage. It doesn't take a whole lot of land to feed a person, but you have to be constantly, um, constantly producing food on that. But I could grow f enough food in Thailand that I could survive on a 30 by 30 foot uh, plot. If I was in Scandinavia, that would take an acre simply because I can't produce food at a, as, for a good chunk of the year. But areas like Spain have that happy medium where they have a longer growing season. So they need less space per person to produce that food. And it makes it easier to produce an excess. And you, when you look at where the great empires occurred mm -hmm. at, at different points in time, it comes back to that industrialization. England would not have become the powerhouse it did if it didn't have industrialization to help it produce. Yeah, fossil fuels, it. absolutely. Fossil yeah. fuels in the banking industry. <laughs> Shannon, and what other... And the and the transportation infrastructure. Right, right. Um, before we hit transportation, I actually want to ask Shannon something because I've never had an expert on water before. Aside from the Egyptian device you mentioned, what other devices or technology has come around which enabled more capable food production? Um. One of the greatest examples, even though it ended up wiping out their empire, is actually the Babylonians. The Babylonians figured out how to move water from the Atlas Mountains to water the desert. Now, they ended up adding lots of salt to the soil and eventually making it so they could no longer produce. They were too efficient in their watering and it, it caused salt to get deposited in their soil, but it caused our first civilizations to occur. Another group that I think is fascinating and it allowed them to avoid warfare and create um, a civilization in the desert is Petra. Mm -hmm. um, that system we, still works today. It still works today and it not only stores water, but it also prevents flash floods. And going and seeing it, it in person, it, it was a pilgrimage for a water scientist. <laughs> what does this system consist of? Is it aqueducts and such? In so Petra? Part of it was, was aqueducts. 
What, it, what did you say, Mr. Mossett? I said it's a, it was a collection system. It basically, and I'm sure probably knows more about this than I do, but it was, as I understand it, they literally spread collection lines everywhere they could put them. As far as we can tell, this is where the Romans got their idea from. Now, there's Not another civilization also, also was pretty adept with water, and that was actually the Incas. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> theirs had to be more localized, though, because they had a problem nobody else faced. They didn't have any trees. Little yeah. known fact about the Incas, there are no large trees indigenous to the western slope of the Andes. The Spanish imported from the Philippines eucalyptus to, fall, to uh, fell that. But before that, that's one of the reasons why the Incas fell to the Spanish. You can't stop a horse without a pike. If you don't have trees, that will give you pikes you can't do it. Yep. If you take a look at their structures, roof trees are very close together and they're made out of stone because these trees are so short that you can't make a roof unless unless the walls are very close together hmm. or unless you use some forms of arches. So they were screwed even though they had a pretty decent water system, but the water systems were all local because you can't cross canyons unless they're very narrow with, with stone aqueducts. But you can't do it with, with wood because they don't have any. That's sort of off the subject, though. No, no, that actually helps. And it runs into transportation. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but I... The Civil War is fascinating for me, and the years after it. And one of the most interesting things to come out of the Civil War was how industrialized the American military became. Oh, yeah. Because there was a need for trains everywhere. Most people don't understand that trains really are quite efficient when it comes to pulling stuff and moving stuff. If you need to move literal metric tons of stuff, that's the best way to go about it. And it remained that way up until what? 1960s, 70s, when semi trucking really got efficient. Well, even today, it's still the most efficient way, other than water, <clears throat> to transport. Well, <clears throat> what's really cool is that the Germans, the Prussians, this, uh, were very interested in the what the United States had done in the Civil War with with trains, and they actually studied the Wild West show for efficiency in loading trains because they would uh, bring a train, have a, their, their own personal train, come into a town, unload the whole thing, build stands, have the entire show ready for the morning, do the show, pack everything up and head for the next town the next day and do it over again. And the German army was extremely f interested in this and they set up their entire Schlieffen plan, which basically started World War I and caused it. Um, based on the Wild West show. So Buffalo Bill Cody is, is basically responsible for World War I. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, someone out there, please write the story of the Prussian spy who infiltrated the Wild West, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West I like show. that idea. Well, yeah. I love they were, that. I they, were doing that so it even, they were doing it even before the uh, Wild West show. As early as... 1865 or so, von Moltke was studying it, yes. and it's what allowed them to do the Austro-Prussian War as quickly as they did. Mm -hmm. Then from there, four years later, they decided to take it to, on to the French and had the Franco-Prussian War, which ended with the Kaiser getting crowned at Versailles. The French, hilariously, had the better rifle, had the better train system, had better mobilization system. What they didn't have was any way to us that they had studied it or planned ahead. They were still running off of doing things the way Napoleon had. What also is interesting is that the Prussians, the Germans, kept that system up through World War I. And during World War I, they continued to use trains to move their troops around. The French, on the other hand, uh, decided to put their money into the infrastructure of roadways and trucks. <laughs> 
And with that to prove to be a lot more versatile and flexible. So um, when the end of the war came, the French were able to actually move their troops faster and more efficiently around based on their experiences by of using taxi cabs to move troops from Paris to the front lines in 1914, uh, which is in and of itself a really fascinating story. But the French using trucks um, to, for their mobile uh, transport. And that, of course, influenced the United States Army. And we were sucking up to the French big time for most of our history. Um, and uh, anyway, it's fascinating how the truck proved more efficient, more flexible than the train did uh, simply in, in military, um, military regards. So the Germans had all these cool little two foot gauge trains that they were taking supplies to the trenches, which was very efficient. But when movement came, it was not. I'd like to take this back, back a few generations in terms of people who are dealing with writers who are dealing with fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. the, Inca, the Inca thing is interesting in more ways than one. Because they didn't have trees, they couldn't build bridges. Because they couldn't build bridges except by ropes, they couldn't use wheels. Then you compound that by the fact that a llama can't carry more than about 60 pounds, and they'll, they'll die before they do that. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about building a culture and you need transportation, you've got to have things that we think of as automatic but have not always been there in different parts of the world. You need a beast of burden. Yep. You need a way to cross obstacles um, just, for be, just for starting point. We tend to take these for granted, but there are some cultures in world history that haven't had them. I mean, the American Indians were basically relying pretty much on dogs. Yeah, they had wheels. We know they had wheels. Uh, there's little Aztec toys that have wheels. They just didn't have a beast of burden that was suitable for pulling anything. And in the case of the Incas, they didn't have any, they couldn't pull it across anything because they couldn't build anything across anything. Well, and if they didn't have any trees, they couldn't build travois either for the dogs. So there yeah. it is. Yeah. And hilariously, ironically, the Germans were the ones still using dogs during World War II for so hauling the, the ammunition cart. So the, did the uh, uh, Belgians. The Belgians were still using dogs to pull their machine gun carts in the beginning of World War II as well. It's a miserable oh. way to try and move stuff across the Russian front in the winter. And the Germans, of course, were still using huge numbers of horses. Uh, mm during World War II. Um, we tend to think of them as being very mechanized, but they weren't. And I know in World War I, the British, speaking of logistics and farming, something like 60% of the bulk transported across the channel uh, during World War I was fodder for the horses, for artillery and cavalry horses. 60%, uh, that's an enormous amount of stuff that has to be transported um, just to keep your animals in some kind of shape. And when in World War II, of course, it was fuel instead. And we just built, you know, uh, pipelines across the channel and did that instead. It was a lot easier. Well, one of the reasons why the Germans end up using horses near the end of World War II was they were short on fuel. Basically, they were yes. trying to save the fuel for the, jet, for the jets and the tanks. I mean, I mean jets, I mean uh, fighter planes. Yeah. Mm. Brandon, you, you mentioned that you'd actually written about this as a in, in one of your books. How did you go about it? Uh, basically, uh, I noticed that a lot of uh, different writers, a lot of stories that I really enjoyed, tended to deal with this problem by kind of just ignoring it. Uh, it you can really get lost in the weeds and get bogged down in it. It doesn't talking about farming in a in a fantasy book doesn't necessarily sound exciting. Um, until you realize all of the problems that you can create with it, um, instead of just kind of you know doing the hand wave them and saying ah oh, everybody got food, uh, you can start talking about man like what happens when, uh, for instance, this vital crop for this civilization, uh, what happens 
or what does a terrorist do to try to disrupt that in order to uh, in order to disrupt the civilization? Well, you attack the canals. Um, the particular area that I was writing required irrigation, and so you attack the canals. And man, that's a giant disruption to the entire system. Uh, things like that that add excitement and intrigue in different ways that people. I don't know, that are just slightly outside of the box really, really caught my attention. And I feel like it made for a really good story. Cool. There's another aspect of that that's historical, too. The Romans didn't want to fight, fight Carthage a third time. So what did they do? They plowed Salted the fields it. with... Made it really, yep. really difficult to grow the, the supplies to feed an army. Carthago de Linda Est. <laughs> yeah, there's something to be said for Roman uh, urban renewal plans. Great engineers, great at destroying too. We should also note for the observer that the Romans did use their legions for quite a bit of labor and construction. They weren't necessarily engaged in farming, but they were doing road construction, aqueduct logistics. Yep. They were laying the groundwork so that if another legion had to follow them somewhere, they could get there. Because troops march better over proper roads. If you're having to break trail, life sucks. Something I wanted to point out, getting back to the farming aspect, is that during ma major wars, whether we're talking about like the American Civil War, uh, World War One, World War II, uh, primarily the farmers in those, like in the South and in France, Germany, Russia, uh, and of course in Russian World War II, were old men and women, because all the young men were off fighting and dying, and so you have these, like the American doughboys, you know, mentioned all over the place how all they saw in the when they were training were old men and young widows, you know, and some old women, and that was it, because all of the young men, it didn't matter what their physical condition was they were up front they were in the in in the, in the army same as in the south in this american civil war virtually all the young men folk were off fighting so all the farming even the really hard work of farming had to be done by old men and women there it is which is why modern technology and farming is so freaking cool yep oh yeah because was one gallon of diesel is worth like 12 men working 12 hours or something like that. It's a lot. It's entirely believable, especially when you look at it. Um, my day job, I travel, I drive through Oklahoma cotton fields. They have now gone completely from people picking cotton for a living, which happened as late as the early 50s, mm -hmm. to where now farmer goes out and does it all with a machine. You don't hear about people picking cotton for a living anymore. Nope. Fossil fuels, man. <laughs> that's made our civilization possible yep and i mean the first uh cotton harvester didn't come into being until 1932. wow yeah well, and I have... one of... go ahead one of the things that happens when you're at war and personally my family my lineage comes from belarusia which there are a few places in Europe that have been taken over by more people at different points in time. I I traveled there to visit and I, I met an old woman in a village who had been in eight different countries. She had never moved houses once in her life. Yuck. And the, you change what you plant when you know that war is happening and you get really, really good at hiding things. So you select food that ripens quickly and is easily hidden potatoes potatoes or that's one of the reasons that potatoes were a big food stuff for europeans is because armies don't come in and they're not gonna go dig them up but if you have a granary full of grain they're gonna take it so you know that's one of the reasons potatoes became such a huge staple in eastern europe especially is because not only is it very easy to deal with but armies aren't going to come take them there's another reason for potatoes. You get more nourishment and nutrition per 
yes. acre, square foot, whatever it is, from potatoes yeah. than any other crop whatsoever. Absolutely. Really? Yeah. yeah, and that's that's one of the reasons why the an Irish potato famine is such a disaster, because basically the Irish had grown dependent on potatoes. They had a population that could be supported by the potatoes they were doing, and then all the potatoes got blighted, and they couldn't change over fast enough, and millions died. And in Belgium and France and Germany, too, but less so because of the a broader selection of crops. That would make a difference. Yeah. Brandon, with canals and what you talked about, how did you go about breaking canals? Uh, with undercover labor, basically. It, it's the uh, civilization that I'm writing about uh, is uh, basically there's this magical uh, based crop uh, that is the food source for uh, literally millions of people, far more than a regular crop could sustain in a small area. Uh, and at the time of it, people just aren't used to the idea that you would disrupt something so vital to so many people. Uh, and so these people are able to sneak in under the cover of night and basically uh, dig out the side of the canal. Uh, it's slightly raised in that area you dig it out and break it down and uh make a giant mess that causes a big problem for everybody that would do it breaking stuff would be an important thing to understand and comprehend if you're going to write about it yep you know <clears throat> the canals brings to mind the dutch revolt against the spanish the 80 years war in the 16th 17th century and of course, the Dutch moved an enormous amount of produce via the canals. Um, there's an interesting, uh, interesting situation in which uh, a city was besieged. Can't remember offhand which one it was, but a city was besieged by the Spaniards. Um, they managed to outlast the siege because they had enough foodstuffs in store. Uh, the Spaniards marched off, and <clears throat> the city fathers decided they were not going to allow more than the normal prices to be paid for uh, wheat to be brought in, for grain, grains to be brought into the town. Uh, because there's a war on and the, the wholesalers or the, the grain dealers did not want to uh, risk their, their product by, by running it through enemy territory and the canals um, for no extra profit, they didn't, they didn't send much. And the, the town didn't, wasn't able to buy as much because they weren't allowed to pay higher prices. And the next time the Spaniards showed up, they didn't have enough food in their granaries and they had to give up. Uh, this is some basic economics of that uh, supplies will go to where the money is. And if you desperately need those supplies, well, you're going to pay higher prices for them. Uh, it's not really, um, you know, it's just ec the way economics works. And whether it's generators in Florida during hurricanes, towns during the Spanish Revolt, um, that's the way it works. And, of course, farming and economics, warfare, it's all closely, closely interrelated. Before we go to the question session, in the Q&A, I did want to bring up a rather enlightening story about how far logistics have come. When we consider all the civilizations we've talked about, we've talked about the Inca having essentially no wood, no really good wood that they could use. We've talked about the Romans. We've talked about the U.S. during the Civil War, the Germans over a course of time. It was in the last year we had an American serviceman get critically ill and injured all at once. And in the space of 24 hours, they put him on a plane from Afghanistan, flew to Germany, took on personnel who began engaging in surgery on board the, the C-5 while flying to San Antonio for the only specialist that the U.S. military had available to handle what this man's uh, situation was. And they managed to do that in the space of 24 hours. America, if we have to do something outrageous and extreme, we can do it because air is not efficient, no. but it works. 
as opposed to lopping off limbs and letting guys die on the battlefield, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Or like the Greeks, oh, he's wounded. Better kill him now. Yeah. Not as good. No. Not great for but, morale. <laughs> also directly impacts how many farmers you have available the next time harvest season comes around. Exactly. And that's another interesting pro thing is that if you can conquer your neighbor and keep his farmers alive, maybe enslave them in the process, but keep them alive, that means you can now have the next generation of more soldiers. You can expand your empire uh, to get more grain, more farmers. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those processes that expands until it can't, and then it collapses. Sort of like Rome. Rome had a lot of things going for it. it. It really did. I mean, it's one of the few civilizations that's had several incarnations. You know, <clears throat> most civilizations last about 250 years, or empires, I should say. Rome did it twice in a row. That's pretty impressive. It um, really is. Yeah. Yep. And Oddly enough, we're about 250 years into ours, so oops. Could be worse. Could be the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, I just sort of drug on forever. <laughs> the Habsburgs just never seem to die. No. They're like cockroaches. Yeah, they remembered everything and learned nothing. <laughs> That's an actual quote from the French on them. <laughs> it's a rather apt and astute obser observation. <clears throat> yeah, sadly. Um, are we ready to take some questions? Let's do it. Cool. So the first question we have is, what kinds of crops are best to grow to keep marauding armies from stealing your crops? Potatoes. The kind that are hard to take and eat quickly. I think we covered that one uh, with the talking about the potatoes. You can hide it easy, uh, and it's hard to just grab as you're running through the field. Yeah, you got to have people out there doing also, ones that are toxic, if not properly processed. Ooh. Taro. You can't just kidnap it. It has to be processed in a very specific order. And you can actually poison the British who show up and try to steal your food if they don't know the correct process to turn it into something edible. Cool. That sounds like something my ancestors would have done when Captain Cook showed up. <laughs> I think they did. Wouldn't After surprise eating him. <laughs> hey, have the white guy to dinner. You get your <clears throat> honor and you get him served up at the same time. That's the other white meat, yeah. You know. Well, there's another early crop like that. Has anybody ever tried to eat an olive straight off the tree? Ooh. No. No. Olives are too. Olives have to be processed. Basically, you've got to soak them in brine, as the equivalent thereof, for a hell of a long time. Oh. Otherwise, they're totally inedible. Which really makes me wonder how this. somebody figured out how to do that. <laughs> it takes you back to the, the principle that I talked about earlier. The people who know how to treat these crops that are hard to steal and hard to eat immediately, people who know how to extract the, the nutrition from those, Man, they suddenly have a lot of power. Yes, they do. You are absolutely correct on that. Next question, sir. So, um, uh, how does uh, from Emma Preston Hankins? Uh, how does the uh, the length of uh, the campaign factor in? For example, in the bi a biography of Joseph uh, of, of Ulysses Grant uh, suggested that one reason he was a more successful commander in the, that war was because of his experience as a logistics officer. And therefore, in the multi-year year war, he had an advantage. Probably so. Like I said earlier, um, you know, amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. Uh, he understood logistics, and so did Sherman, for that matter. Uh, you know, Sherman said that if um, uh, was it Hood wanted to take his army which was supposed to defend atlanta if he wanted to take that and attack ohio sherman said he'd send him rations to do so um because <clears throat> you know sherman understood this thing and that's the um grant understood that water 
was the primary transportation system in the Western United States, certainly in the, what we call the Midwest, but uh, the Mississippi system. And by controlling the waterways, he controlled the whole area because he could feed his troops, uh, whether it was from produce from Ohio uh, and Illinois, or whether it was uh, taking it from the locals, uh, didn't matter, but he could transport it to his troops. Hood, to his shame, was the one who decided to burn his supplies that he couldn't move with him, which yeah. is what actually caused the burning of Atlanta. <clears throat> yeah. He burned a whole lot of ordinance, bad things happen. Yeah. <clears throat> Hood has a better reputation than he deserves. Yeah, at some point he got in over his head. <laughs> 